We are standing in the St. Augustine National Cemetery. This place became very special because of an event that took place here on August 15, 1842. But to understand why that was so special, one would have to travel back six and a half years and about 140 miles southwest of here to a quiet place along the old Fort King Road. They get to this point, Seminole stand up and all fire one volley. The whole left line went down, dead or wounded, leaving the back line still standing and confused. Started taking the great coats off, started taking the weapons out, make sure they're loaded, get rid of the fire. Most of them had taken hiding places behind trees. The cannon wheeled up here. They started firing that cannon. December 22nd, in 1835, Major Date and 100 soldiers, seven officers left Fort Brook, which is present day Tampa. They were on a 10 day march going to reinforce Fort King, present day Ocala. They were coming up this trail you see back here. On day six, December 28th, they reached this point. He's listening to his men. They're telling him, we hear Seminoles out there. We, we, we hear the Indians out there. We know they're there. He's listening to them. Just pine trees and palmettos. There was no oak trees in this area at the time. It was a cold, rainy morning. The first um, presentation by the park ranger was very informative. Uh, not too much acting, but it gave us a broad overall view of what we were to expect. And then when we got on the actual battlefield itself, the uh, Irish pri private that greeted us first. We're going to take you down to a land called Florida. I have to heard it love Florida, and he says, oh, you love it. It's a land of flowers, milk and honey dripping off the trees. It's beautiful there all the time. He brought us into character and actually brought us back to 1835 and Dade Battlefield. My friends, let me tell you, I've been in Florida now for eight months. I haven't seen the first flower yet. And the mosquitoes, they're as big as eagles they are. And they come all the time. Day and night they come. But we don't bother that too much because of our uniforms. Nice wool, perfect uniform for Florida, don't you know? So, I'm told I haven't seen one yet. For eight months I've been in Florida, this territory. I haven't seen one yet, but they tell me that if I see a Seminole, I'm to walk up to him like a gentleman and say, excuse me, sir, would you please mind very much to take yourself and your whole family and move a thousand miles to the west to the Indian territories that some call Oklahoma. So I said, I'm to ask him that. And he says, well, sure. And I said, well, what happens if he says, no, thank you, I'd rather not. And he says, well, you got to shoot him. I said, I don't want to shoot nobody. And I've got a musket, but I haven't even fired it yet except for practice. And he says, well, that would be good practice for you to see then, Patty. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I can tell you one thing, my friends. I'm making me $6 a month, I'm getting fed, I'm wearing me world uniform, but I hate Florida. I'd much rather be somewhere else, anywhere else. The heat is overbearing. You don't know if there's a Seminole hiding behind any tree or bush around you, so you're on your guard most of the time. Not much time to let your hair down, if you would. So then, that's me lot, that's me lot in Florida in 1835. A lot of my um, study has been in asymmetric warfare. And the same principles, the same tactics and procedures that were used back then are used in our operating environment today. Um, I actually served overseas in the Middle East, and we don't fight a contemporary army. As a matter of fact, none of the, uh, none of the combatants we fight today have the uniforms on, just like the Seminoles back in 1835. We're fighting an asymmetric war and looking at lessons from the past and applying them to today. Um, today's experience is very valuable in uh, understanding our operating environment today. Lieutenant Bassinger. An artillery officer, not an infantry officer, but an artillery officer who's only fought from ships and forts. His first thinking was, aha, let's build a fort. Indian chief got his intel from his scouts. He uses that intel. He says to himself, soldiers hiding behind a tree, it would take three of my braves to come up and get that one soldier behind that tree. That soldier might take out two of my Indians before one would kill him. But now they're building a pig pen and they're gonna be climbing in that pig pen. If they're gonna climb in that pig pen, I can surround them now and pick them off without having to lose any of my men. 
I was picking it up also, especially about the Seminoles and how their strategy just was executed flawlessly that day, how their tactics, techniques, and procedures capitalized on their strengths. And, uh, and, and then again, from, the, from, the, uh, from Major Dade's side, how some failures played you know, a major role in, in their overwhelming defeat that day. Uh, just not paying attention to some signs that were out there. And so uh, whether those uh, were in 1835 here or outside the wire in Afghanistan, uh, those things are the same. What was the most important thing you wanted to teach them today? Well, I wanted to give them a sense of the history of where my people came from, how they survived. It's important to listen to your people and what they're telling you but for intelligence reasons. It's important to not so much what you see sometimes as what you don't see. Do you hear the insects? Do you hear the birds? Are game moving as they should be? Or do you not hear any insects? You don't see any birds flying. You don't see any game moving. That tells me that there's a predator of some type that's out there. Something's not right. What is it? So that immediately would put me on alert to realize that everything's not the way it should be. Back to the battle, along the way, they encountered burned out bridges on the Big and Little Hillsborough River, the Big and Little Withlacoochee River. That's the first sign that you got trouble. At nighttime, the soldiers, even the officers, could hear the Seminoles out in the woods. What more will tell you that you got trouble brewing? Soldiers gathering into the breastwork. Seminoles come back. They surrounded on all three sides, started shooting, kicked them all off one at a time. There wasn't a round left from the soldiers. The soldiers who were still alive was picking ammo out of dead man's ammo patches to keep firing until the last man was down. All but four men died. The Seminoles didn't massacre, didn't, didn't cut, didn't do anything to them. They were left for dead. And then, in 1842, they sent wagons from St. Augustine here from the headquarters back down to that battlefield where Major Dade and his command perished on December 28, 1835. And there were a few other battlefields where soldiers had been buried after the conflict. And so they brought them all back here to St. Augustine, to the Post Cemetery. And on August 15, 1842, one of the, probably one of the most dramatic military ceremonies that's ever been staged in our country, was conducted right here in St. Augustine. On that day of August 15th, they took those bodies, the remains of those soldiers who had fought here for the seven years of that war, and they reinterred them underneath three coquina pyramids. So the soldiers were all laid to rest one last time, and then for the remainder of day, the morning cannon, but a steady firing of cannon to mark uh, this service of burying the soldiers. A week after this, Colonel Worth issued from his command a one-line announcement. Hostilities in Florida have hereby ceased. And this marked the end of the longest Native American war in our nation's history. Mm -hmm.